Diabetes, especially pre-diabetes, we talk about it, we all know somebody with it, but we always feel like, no, I can never have it. Parents bring their kids to me, saying, her neck looks very dirty. I see so many 17, 18, 20-year-olds with what we call typical type 2 diabetes. The drastic increase is in type 2 diabetes, which is now seen literally at any age group. A lifestyle doesn't make you count calories or measure things. Look, I walk five miles. I walk six miles every day. I am active. I don't need more exercise. So, this is my response. I am sorry, but that doesn't count. Do something to be active every single day of the week, and then maybe one day of the week, Saturday or Sunday, challenge yourself. Cortisol, or your stress hormone, is that next hormone, which plays a very, very important role in high blood sugars. Hello everyone, we are back with yet another very important topic, which is diabetes. So globally, diabetes has reached pandemic proportions with one in three people suffering from either diabetes or pre-diabetes globally. So we have with us a renowned clinical endocrinologist, Dr. Ashwini Gori. So she is at the Lone Center in Macon, Georgia in the United States. So hello, Ashwini. Welcome to this podcast, Microbiome Superhero Podcast. And uh, if you could give a brief introduction about yourself, that would be great. Yes. Thank you, Rashmi. And it's an honor to be here today. Uh, so my medical training was MBBS in India, Bharti Vidya Peet in Pune, India, after which I came to the United States, uh, actually did some master's training in biomedical engineering before going on to do internal medicine residency and then uh, a fellowship in diabetes, endocrinology, and medical genetics. Uh, so right now, for the last 13 years, I have been working as a clinical endocrinologist. Uh, I also teach medical students and residents um, in the local community hospitals. And then I'm part of some pharmaceutical clinical trials because we always say you cannot stop at what you already know. Science is a growing field and we constantly need uh, new medicines, new breakthroughs. Uh, so happy to be here and share some thoughts today. Thank you so much, Ashwini. That was wonderful. So when we talk, we are always talking about gut health and its importance, its correlation with all kinds of diseases. We wanted to focus on something that is extremely important and relevant to India, not just India, but globally, diabetes, which has reached pandemic proportions. So when we talk about diabetes or pre-diabetes, everybody knows somebody who is suffering from it. Or if I talk about, you know, knowing that somebody has diabetes or pre-diabetes, do you see people who obviously have diabetes or pre-diabetes, but do not know about it themselves? When you see patients or when you see people, is that something that is unknown to a lot of people? It, it is. So it comes as quite a surprise that something this common, diabetes, especially pre-diabetes, we talk about it, we all know somebody with it, but we always feel like, no, I can never have it. Uh, and you see people walking on the street, uh, or I should say people you meet at dinner, friends, uh, people you associate with at work. And there are many symptoms or signs that you can see. Now, generally speaking, a big association, we always think about this person is overweight or obese. They must have bad sugars. They must have high cholesterol. They must have heart disease. And it's true, a lot of the times overweight or obesity is associated with diabetes or prediabetes. Uh, but I always say we shouldn't make or jump to conclusions based on first impressions. They are important, but there are many other subtle signs and symptoms going on that you should watch out for. Uh, the three things we learn in medical school, they're called polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. 
So simply put, in a layman's term, if somebody is feeling hungry all the time, craving, craving sugars, craving sweets, craving food, they are going to the bathroom to urinate, to pee several times through the day, more importantly, waking up several times through the night uh, to do it, uh, and then feeling thirsty all the time, drinking lots of water. They could be telltale signs that something is going on with the sugar. Somebody is having wounds that don't heal very nicely, skin that is thin or bruises or hurts easy, uh, sometimes infections that come on pretty quickly. So there are many signs or symptoms that we can watch out for, uh, tingling, numbness, burning, so neuropathy-like symptoms. So don't just go by, hey, this person looks good or they are slim, they cannot have diabetes, or this person is overweight or obese. That is true in some cases, but watch out for these other symptoms, thirst, urination, wounds that are not healing, neuropathy-like symptoms. Those would be other things to look at. Now, one other thing I say, uh, which I find pretty commonly, a lot of parents bring their kids to me saying, her neck looks very dirty. Uh, or the underarm pits, the area looks very dark. So there are skin changes also that you will see in people with diabetes. So look out, watch out, ask for symptoms, care about your friends and family members. You might realize there's many more people who need to go see a doctor than just the person who's overweight or obese. I'm glad you uh, mentioned all of these, Ashwini. So the reason I asked about this is because, you know, we already know that diabetes has reached pandemic proportions globally, but yet there are so many more people who might be suffering from it, who do not know they are. And I don't know how long they will continue in that path of going through diabetes without knowing it. It's dangerous if we just think about what else can happen if they're going through without any medication or any change in the lifestyle, and not knowing they have it. So the actual numbers are far bigger than what we know. And that is a scary thing. So that was one of the reasons. And as you rightly said, it's not always the people who are overweight that might be suffering from diabetes. There might be lean people who are also pre-diabetic who might also be unhealthy in terms of gut health. And they have no idea that they are going to be diagnosed later on with a lot of, uh, you know, blood sugar that's much higher than they expected. So uh, you also mentioned kids, children coming to you with these skin changes or pigmentation. So is that something that you are commonly seeing these days? So, so I say now this is the sad reality today. So before we go too deep into diabetes, I say typically we think of diabetes as type 1 and type 2. So when I was in medical school 30, 35 years ago at this time, the distinction seemed very clear. Kids who developed diabetes when they were one year old, two year old, four years old, their cells were destroyed, uh, they needed insulin, those were type one diabetics. Generally speaking, we learned in medical textbooks that type two diabetes is a disorder of the middle-aged or older population. So generally thought, you have to be 50, 60, 65 before you get diagnosed. In today's day and age, I see so many 17, 18, 20 year olds with what we call typical type two diabetes. Now type two diabetes yeah. is generally thought to be some genetic predisposition, but it is definitely a lifestyle issue. There are a lot of factors that go in. Maybe we have gotten too sedentary. Uh, we no longer have to go hunt for our food. Uh, we have cars to take us everywhere. We are sitting at our desk all day long. So the changes, the conveniences of our modern lifestyle have brought around changes. We don't utilize energy the way we used to before. And type 2 diabetes, which 30 years ago used to be something that you dealt with as a 50, 60, or 70 year old, I see a lot of it in my patients who I generally see patients over 17 years of age. Um, but I also have a lot of parents tell me, 
I have a 12 year old, a 14 year old, a 15 year old. Will you see them since you see me already? So that is the sad truth. You are seeing a lot of type two diabetes very early on in life. Wow. So I actually expected to hear type 1 diabetes in children because that is also a very shocking number that uh, type 1 diabetes is becoming a lot more common than it used to. I, I don't think we had heard of it being so common in children. But uh, just looking at the numbers of type 2 diabetes is something that is really shocking to see in uh, you know teenagers who are yet to build their life. They're just starting out choosing their careers. And if they have to deal with something like as serious as diabetes, then it's a completely, you know, shocking thing. And most parents are not even aware of this. They are when they are making food choices for their children or they're allowing their children to eat the kind of unhealthy junk food, processed foods, that most people are doing these days. They are not thinking of these long-term consequences that they are going to face as teenagers in their early 20s and how it is going to affect their entire life. So it is, uh, I mean, I'm very surprised to hear that I was actually expecting a totally different aspect of type one. So I am going to say in that regard, I, th I think the numbers have changed in both respects. The drastic increase is in type 2 diabetes, which is now seen literally at any age group. Uh, but on that same note, type 1 diabetes, which we really thought was limited to certain parts of the world, uh, certain genetic traits, and very young children, I have actually seen a lot of what I call young adults, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, especially after the COVID pandemic, develop what's now thought of as type 1 diabetes, or we sometimes call it type one and a half, which really means they don't quite fit into that one or two, but have features of both. Yes. And I know we'll delve on this a little bit deeper uh, later in this conversation, but I do feel like our microbiome has a lot to do with those changes that we're seeing. Absolutely. You brought in a very important point that whenever we talk about any of these diseases and the increased incidence of all of these, we have covered many in the past and diabetes is a very, very important one. Mm -hmm. And the changes in gut health, the, uh, the reduction of diversity of the microbiome, the, uh, the functions that they do are extremely important. So when we don't have them in our gut, they are going to impact all parameters of our health. And something as serious as metabolic syndrome or diabetes happening so early on because of a lack of germs in our body is something that, you know, it's unimaginable that this is the reason for all of the things that are going on. Yes. And most people are not even aware of that, that this is what they are doing, especially after the pandemic with this uh, oh, excessive hygiene that people have been practicing, staying indoors, not socializing, all of the things that are, uh, you know, counterintuitive that prevent germs from populating our bodies are leading to this poor gut health. Mm -hmm. And sedentary lifestyle, of course, was there even before the pandemic. Poor choices of food was also there before the pandemic. That's true. So all of these things added together are leading to this global pandemic, even more severity, even younger ages. Okay. So if we talk about the children or teenagers who are coming to you with this kind of an issue, who are being diagnosed either with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, what are the things that uh, you recommend normally? Is there something uh, that includes a change in their lifestyle or a change in their diet? Is that the primary thing or do they directly go on medications? So definitely. So, there is... <laughs> so the answer is both. Now, as I say this with caution, I am a physician, I'm a clinical endocrinologist, so no question about it. Uh, you will get medicine when you come to see me. Uh, but my biggest and my first recommendation or comment to patients is there are no miracle medicines. There are absolutely no miracle medicines. So you have to put in the work, you have to do the work for that medicine to work for you to help you. Uh, and lifestyle change goes a very, very long way 
when it comes to treating diabetes. Uh, so definitely, now what do I mean by lifestyle change? So that's where I say, let's break it down. So simply put, we always talk about diet and exercise. Those are the two simple terms of oh, make a change in your diet and start exercising and you will feel better, you will do better. And there is some truth to it, but I think people need more direction than just diet or eat this or don't eat this. And what I see, if I send somebody home with just a three month prescription of a lifestyle change, uh, they go out, they read something on the internet or they go see a dietitian. A lot of the times what they come back with is, I was told I can never eat, insert whatever food you want to. I can never eat rice again. I can never eat fruits again. I can never do this again. And some will do it for a few weeks. Others won't even try. But by three months, most of them will fail. And that's where the important thing is not banning a certain food, not telling somebody you can never eat or drink this or that again, but really finding a way to eat something in a modest quantity and not let it affect things in the body, not let it affect your sugars in the body. The second part or exercise, once again, moving is important, but you don't want to do too much or too little. What kind of exercise is important? And then I will add a third component to this before we go into details about each. And the third thing is really think about mental health that diabetes diagnosis is distressing. It's hard, life is hard. Getting up in the morning, going to school, going to work, going to college, keeping up with all your responsibilities is hard. And now you tell somebody you have to check your blood sugar, you have to take medicine, you have to do something different, it's even harder. So let's look at, we need three components. We need diet or a good lifestyle, we need exercise and we need mental health. And all of that with the addition of medicine, if needed, is what's needed to treat or control diabetes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about dietary guidelines for treatment of diabetes or prevention of pre-diabetes turning into diabetes. So as I said before, I generally tell people there are no 100% content indications in life. Uh, you really have to live your whole life with a diet or a lifestyle that you can sustain. So think about what is the problem with diabetes? It's your body's ability to handle sugar. So if there is one piece of advice I'm going to give you, it is going to be you want to avoid direct sugar. So if there's only one change that you're going to make and you said, that's all I can do one day at a time, then I really say, do not drink your sugar. So whether it is sugar, definitely from soft drinks or sodas, whether it is sugar that you're adding to tea or coffee, but also think about what I call relatively good sugar. So fruit juice, uh, wherever you can, try to avoid drinking that sugar. Now, I also tell my patients, as long as you have teeth in your mouth, you need to bite and chew and process that food. So if you want to eat, eat an orange, eat an apple, eat a banana, don't juice it, don't smoothie it because you're losing the fiber. Your body doesn't have to work hard to break down and digest that food. All it's doing is sipping it up, putting that sugar in your blood, and then there's a lot of chaos in the, in the body. So if there's one thing you're going to take home, it is do not, do not drink your sugar. Now coming to foods, there is no good or bad food. It's how much you eat of it that really makes it good or bad. But having said that, uh, I really say, if you look back at advice from our ancestors, now I also say I am a yoga and Ayurveda practitioner. So using a little bit of that knowledge in here too, there are a few concepts which are age old, thousands of years old. And one of it that strikes or stays with me is you are what you eat. 
our body is made up of many layers, but that physical body, the first layer, we really say whatever you eat, that's what you're going to become, feel like, look like. So you have to decide, are you going to feed it fresh, natural, seasonal food, or are you going to feed it something chemical, processed, a bright red, blue color, um, or is it something that grew in nature and should be had? The second thing, which is a very beautiful teaching from our old scriptures, uh, if you look at old sages uh, or saints who went from house to house and asked for food, what did they ask for? They didn't ask for plates full or buckets full of food. They asked for a handful. Hi, I'm Dr. Rashmi Kulkani, co-founder of Arnagen Next Solutions, a microbiome-based resource platform that provides digital solutions for microbiome courses for uh, students and professionals in all streams of life sciences and medicine, digital apps for children to develop healthier habits. We also do webinars and outreach programs to educate the general audience about the importance of the gut microbiome. We have our very own Shatayushi 360 degrees total transformation program to improve all parameters of gut health and to prevent chronic diseases. I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. And what that's telling us, even science, you can eat your rice, you can eat your chapati, you can eat your pasta, whatever carb that you want to, but your hand, the size of your handful is actually a very good guide to what or how much you want to eat. So next time, think about, hey, I want to eat rice. I have diabetes or pre-diabetes. Eat it in a handful and let the rest of the things on your plate be fresh leafy vegetables or be a piece of protein or let them be sprouts or lentils or pulses. And you cannot go wrong. You will be able to eat mostly everything that you want to in life. Uh, without running into trouble. So my advice is really, I do not believe in any kind of fad dieting. Every diet fails, but a lifestyle sticks with you forever. You don't have to, a lifestyle doesn't make you count calories or measure things. Uh, your body, your stomach size, your fist size are very good guides to how much you need to eat. Now, going to that food, um, I also tell people there has to be diversity in your food. So eat a rainbow. Uh, truly, what that means is we have different colored fruits and vegetables. We have greens and yellows and oranges and purples. Eat every color of that rainbow on your plate every day. It doesn't have to come at one meal. It can come separately through the day, spread out. But really, eat that rainbow, eat four to five servings of vegetables through the day, eat three to five servings of fruit through the day. Yes, I said eat fruit, even if you have prediabetes or diabetes. Just don't eat all five fruit at the same time. So that's kind of uh, the important thing to remember. There are better and worse choices, even in healthy foods. So your strawberries, your blueberries, your blackberries, your berries, are better or have lower GI indexes, uh, which means they're going to spike your blood sugar a little less than maybe eating a banana. But who wants a big banana? Eat half a banana and you can still enjoy it. So really enjoy everything that nature has given you uh, in moderation and you will be fine. Why do we need to do that? Now that's going down into over the years we have known, or our scriptures have told us, we are what we eat and food makes or breaks us. Uh, what it has not told us clearly, but what research has told us over the years, is we have a whole ecosystem of organisms living in our gut. We have bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, all of these creatures in our gut and what you start out with, what creatures living in your gut, uh, they are basically going to either make you really healthy 
or predisposed you to disease, to infections and various things. So when we are eating a rainbow of foods, when we are diversifying our diet, we are really helping some of those good bacteria, good viruses, good creatures to grow better in our gut and maybe get rid of some of the harmful inflammatory stuff in our gut, which over the long run is going to help us get better control over these diseases. I really feel like this is also the reason why you may have two people in the same house eat the same thing, but one person may develop diabetes, the other does not. One person may lose weight, the other does not. The changes or the differences in your gut microbiome really determine the end effect, what you're going to see at the end of the day. But definitely when you're looking at your food, don't look at it as a diet to do for six weeks or one year or two years. Look at it as a lifestyle that will give you a healthy and healthful life, lifelong. I know there's Those a lot to be wonderful here. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, definitely. I'm sure. So, yeah. It is so very just... interesting that you said that, uh, you know, going back to our ancient scriptures, ancient traditions, mm -hmm. and what you're telling your patients now. Mm -hmm. And if we look at uh, everything that you have covered, these are some very, very simple things to cover. And the most important point that you talked about is the sustainability. That whenever people are going for any kind of a fad diet, they might give some kind of temporary solutions, but mm -hmm. they lead to long-term effects that might be very, very harmful, which people don't know at that time. So looking at something that is sustainable, which people can carry on for their entire life, it's amazing that whatever you just talked about was present in our ancient traditions. Mm -hmm. And it aligns exactly with improving the diversity of the gut microbiome. This is something that people really need to know and to be made aware that this is what we need to feed our gut microbiome. This is what we need to make it a lot more diverse. And it is going to help prevent all of these lifestyle diseases. Diabetes is one of them, of course. It, it, it so definitely be a very easy solution that most people can apply in their daily life okay so talking about fitness we are looking at two different extremes here most people lead a very sedentary lifestyle and there's the other extreme who over exercise and their nutrition does not match what they are doing at all mm -hmm. so what are the kinds of people you see in your clinic who are diabetic so definitely, as I say, I start with a joke, uh, and I know most of you have probably seen this on the internet, uh, where the patient comes in and says, doctor, diabetes runs in my family. And the doctor says, no, the problem is nobody runs in your family. Uh, so, so really, but jokes apart, uh, fitness is important. No, you don't have to run to treat uh, diabetes. I will say, before we start about fitness. And I want everybody to exercise consciously every day. But the first thing I will say, exercise and uh, if you look at mortality, the risk of dying, uh, then that graph, if you look at it, follows what we call a bell-shaped curve. So I'm, I'm just going to show you, or it's a U-shaped curve, which means if we look at mortality, the risk of dying versus exercise. Exercise on your x-axis and the risk of dying on your y. When we first start exercising, the more you exercise, the lower that risk of dying. So that is good. After a while, that benefit kind of equalizes. But at the other extreme, if you are into extreme exercising or sports, you also see a much higher risk of dying so a lot of people give me that excuse, oh, I have so many office co-workers, I have friends who died running a marathon at 39 or 40 years, so that is why I don't run, or that is why I'm not going to exercise. And yes, I will tell you this, any extreme, just like we talked about food, I say the same thing for diet. You were born with certain genetics, you were born with a certain muscle and heart capacity, challenge it, do what you can, but don't overdo it. 
it should be your challenge it should be your goal don't compete against x and y every day and you will not run into trouble now that being said i see a majority of people with diabetes or pre diabetes not exercising not being active or not working out so some in some people it's very very clear you have an office job or a desk job that makes you sit for 10 or 12 hours a day that's easy to pinpoint and say hey you are sitting all day long you're not getting the cardiovascular exercise that you need but then i have some people who say i stand and i walk at my work every single day they show me their apple watches or their fitbits and they say look i walk 5 miles i walk 6 miles every day i am active i don't need more exercise so this is my response i am sorry but that doesn't count so anything that you do every day on a day to day basis where your heart rate doesn't go up where your body doesn't burn any extra calories does not count so exercise has to be such that it is challenging it makes your heart beat faster and it burns calories or it improves insulin sensitivity in this case when you're trying to treat diabetes so what is a good exercise anything that meets that requirement so let me start by saying walking is a beautiful exercise we humans were meant to walk but how should you walk if you are walking and you are carrying on a full conversation with your friends if you are walking and you can sing a whole song to yourself it's too easy it will give you stress release it will give you mental benefits it will not give you the benefit that you need to treat or cure your diabetes so walking is great but walk so that if somebody stops you you can maybe answer in a yes or a no or a short phrase but you shouldn't be able to speak in full sentences you should definitely not be able to sing a song to yourself now that's easy so walking will do it running will do it swimming will do it hiking elliptical whatever dancing do what feels good to you but do what is still challenging and makes your heart rate go up do it at least for 30 minutes 5 days a week at least sometimes more than that uh my principle is definitely do something to be active every single day of the week and then maybe one day of the week saturday or sunday challenge yourself if you are used to walking 2 miles every day in your neighborhood on saturday try to walk four it doesn't have to come at the same time you don't have to have an hour or 2 hours of free time to exercise you are sitting at a desk job 10 hours a day every hour on the hour get up do some jumping jacks go climb a flight of stairs and come back and spread it out even if you exercise one and a half to 2 minutes at a time to bring your heart rate up and spread it out through the day you will get the same benefits that we are talking about so don't make excuses make time to exercise yeah those were some very easy tips but what you told about walking i don't think most people are aware of that because people think that walking at any pace is walking and it's the same the quality of the walk as you mentioned is a very important point that people need to understand because most people are walking while they are talking on the phone or while they are uh, you know interacting with somebody else it's definitely not a brisk walk for most people and it's something that's important uh, that you covered so even when people are exercising they spend the uh, rest of the day being on their uh, desks not moving at all the rest of the day is still sedentary and they think that that's all that was the walking that they needed to do and uh, don't really exercise so those were some amazing points that you covered the third thing that you mentioned about mental health now if we look at what mental health experts talk about in terms of diabetes what i hear Uh, very commonly these days is that diabetes is a result 
of the emotional baggage that people carry. That is also something that I hear a lot from people who work in this field of mental health. So uh, when we hear this, that, you know, uh, emotional health is linked to diabetes and then people have this diagnosis of diabetes that itself is very stressful. So what is it that uh, people coming to you can get from, is there any kind of a recommendation that you do in terms of uh, mental health? Yes, so definitely. As, as I said, there are three components to health. So diet and exercise. So your physical body and uh, your exercise is very important, but you cannot forget the mental aspect uh, of health. So mental, emotional, spiritual well-being to me is extremely important. And I look at it not only from dealing with a disease state and what it brings with it, uh, but as an endocrinologist, I also say the things that go on inside. So with diabetes, we always talk about sugars and insulin. Uh, but as an endocrinologist, I deal with different hormones in our body. And cortisol or stress hormone is one of them. I really feel like, so if maybe God was also scared of low blood sugars, uh, as I say this jokingly, but it's true. We only have one hormone in our body which lowers blood sugar. That is insulin. We have multiple hormones that our body secretes to increase blood sugar. Okay, so glucagon is one, uh, and that has a little to do. We, ha we don't have time for details today, but if you eat right and if you diet or have a good lifestyle, then your food habits can improve that glucagon metabolism. Cortisol or your stress hormone is that next hormone which plays a very, very important role in high blood sugars, increasing blood sugars. So not only is mental health important to feel better, but it's also important to de-stress or decrease the level of cortisol production, which is in turn going to worsen your blood sugars. Uh, now, what does mental health mean? So once again, I know there are many, many experts in psychology and psychiatry who can delve deeper into this. These are my quick and easy or simple facts to patients. Any activity that makes you forget about the past, makes you not worry about the future, and keeps you in that present moment is going to benefit you. So really think about when we think of or when we tell people, oh, you need to meditate every day or you need to deep breathe every day. It is actually easier said than done. It is hard. Even I cannot sit down in a corner, be still and not think about anything at, at all. So when I think of meditation, the easier way to start out with stress release or meditation is not being quiet, is not being still, but getting into the flow or getting into an activity that you enjoy, that really dissolves that feeling of the past and the future. It takes away anxieties. Uh, it really makes you forget or lose track of time. And it makes you forget or lose track of your self-consciousness. Now, any activity like that is going to give you the same effect as meditation. So I, I really recommend, exercise is important, but I definitely recommend my patients to play a sport or learn or play a musical instrument or learn a new language uh, or paint or draw or dance. So do something that's really going to take you away from have I paid my electricity bill? Uh, do I have projects at work tomorrow? So anything that takes you away is meditation. That's, that's number one. The second thing is clutter in the mind. Anytime you get diagnosed, it's always, why do I have diabetes? Why me? Why do I need to take medicine? Why do I need to diet? Uh, if all those thoughts are just cluttered in your mind, they're going to cause stress, they're going to cause anxiety. Speak them out, have a conversation with your mind, figure out what you can do to help the cause, figure out what you have no control over like genetics and 
you just have to move on. Figure out where you need to get help. So asking for help, seeing a psychologist, needing to see a dietitian, these do not make you weaker. They make you stronger. They put you in a better position to take care of yourself. So don't attach any taboos with you need somebody else's support to get you there. Uh, that's my quick and easy about mental health. Do an activity that makes you happy, gives you enjoyment, makes you forget about the past and the future, and keeps you in the present. Wonderful. That covered a very important aspect of diabetes and mental health. And definitely there's no shame or there's uh, nothing wrong about getting help and improving mental health because that is also uh, shown scientifically to improve all parameters of gut health, the gut microbiome. And again, it has far reaching implications on entire health. So I think there's one last question that I would like to ask is that, as you said, people come to you saying that, uh, you know, diabetes runs in their family. There's a genetic component to it as well. So can people really expect or uh, give up on it that it is running in their family so they are going to have it? Or is there something that they can do to fix it or prevent it that's, that's in right. spite of being genetically predisposed? That's, that's right. So so I, I look at it as, yes, diabetes has a strong genetic link. There's no question about it. Whether it's type 1 or it's type 2 diabetes, we do see certain genes run in the family. But you have to think about genetics per se, you cannot change. But there is what is called epigenetics. So even when you inherit genes, your environment, your lifestyle, your gut microbiome, things that you do or do not do influence how that gene is going to be expressed. And that is why even when we have twins, uh, who are genetically identical, if they have drastically different lifestyles, drastically different diets, you are going to see different outcomes in, in both of them. So at the end of the day, you may be born with the genes, but what you do, how you take care of yourself is going to really impact how those genes are expressed and whether you will develop diabetes or prediabetes, uh, or you will not, or if you did develop it, will you be able to control it or not? Uh, so yes, your epigenetics are in your hand. The power is still yours. Thank you so much, Ashwini, for those really insightful points about not just how many people are suffering from diabetes and how parents really need to watch out for the teenagers, their children, who also might have symptoms of diabetes and people just don't think that it's possible to uh, see it in such a young age. So that is something that I uh, hope people look out for. And the easy tips that you have given in terms of diet, in terms of fitness, the thing about walking and how it is so misunderstood as to what is the right kind of walking that people need to do and mental health, its importance in everybody's life, not in just diabetics and the genetic predisposition. Yes, there is something that we can do about it. We can fix our lifestyle. We can fix our fitness. We can work on it. And it is a sustainable thing that we can continue on throughout our entire life. So thank you for your wonderful insight about diabetes and prediabetes. I'm sure the viewers have learned a lot from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rashmi. This has been a pleasure joining you today. And I'm hoping even if we can impact a few lives, we will make a change. <laughs> Do you know that there's a chance that you might be diabetic? Have you thought that children might be diabetic? Teenagers might be diabetic. Is that a consideration we have given? When we think about diabetes, we always think that, oh, if I have a family history of diabetes, only then I might have it but it is becoming more and more common for teenagers to have diabetes, for people in their 20s, 30s, 40s to have diabetes or prediabetes. So if you haven't gotten yourself tested now, do it. It has already reached pandemic proportions. It is scary. 
and this is majorly because of a poor lifestyle because of a sedentary lifestyle poor nutrition and mental health of course all of these things are preventable good health is not accidental it is a choice that we make do we choose a healthy sustainable lifestyle do we choose good nutrition for ourselves and for our children what are the changes they are going to face if they are diagnosed with diabetes early on give all of this a thought we just heard some very very important points about how diabetes happens what are the things that people need to consider for themselves for their children these were some really amazing learnings and very simple tips that we just heard in this podcast so i'm sure all of you have learned a lot we are going to bring in even more important aspects of diabetes so if you thought that diabetes is a disease only for people who are overweight or obese that's not really true if you thought diabetes only happens in people who are in their 50s 60s or 70s that is not true either we just heard that diabetes can happen to anyone even it is it is seen very commonly in children in teenagers now things are not the same as they were a decade ago or two decades ago things have changed dramatically because of our poor choices of lifestyle a sedentary lifestyle poor nutrition eating all kinds of junk food and very poor mental health all of these are major contributors to this pandemic of diabetes that we are seeing across age groups and across health conditions or health or uh, status so if we want to prevent something like diabetes the choice is very simple a simple fix in our lifestyle a simple fix in our nutrition a simple fix in our fitness and mental health is going to take us a long way in preventing diabetes can you do that for yourself for your children in order to prevent this pandemic for getting even bigger stay tuned for more such insights about diabetes and about all of the chronic conditions that we are bringing in through this wonderful podcast your very own microbiome superhero podcast i hope you enjoy the series see you in the next one